Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So I'm here today to talk to you about how the names you give things can create a positive culture. Um, in design systems, we have lots of names from the design system itself to variable names to uh, functions and our open source repositories that we host them on. Oh, come on. Cool. Um, so I'm currently building the Australian government's design system. Um, my name is Alex Page. Uh, it's not spelled like that. It's actually Alex Page, like a book. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> um, no, it's not short for Alexander Page. It's just Alex Page. Um, yeah, probably if I went onto a website, it would probably be taken as well. Um, and if I went lowercase and removed the spaces, that would probably also be taken. Um, if I had another A, yeah, probably taken as well. It's pretty frustrating, right? With just my name, I can't even use it. Um, so if you want to follow me on Twitter, that's my name. Um, <laughs> pretty annoying, right? So as you can already see, um, naming things is hard, and how we name things can affect how we communicate. Um, without names um, and communication, we wouldn't be here today. For instance, the name of the building, the name of the street, um, were all important factors to how we got here. Um, communication can also cause anxiety um, when we're not comfortable in the situation that we're put in. So recently, I looked like this, and I needed a haircut. Um, I've been hiking for four months. I'd not really been in any cities or anything. It was really hairy. So um, I didn't want it to be a bad haircut. So instinctively, I did a Google search, you know, what are the trends and things like this. So decided that I was going to get a number three fade into a disconnected <laughs> undercut. I don't even know what that is, but, you know, I thought it would be pretty cool, pretty hipster. Um, but the point I'm trying to make here is we use different words for different interactions. When I'm speaking mm. with a professional hairdresser, I may use that language. They may understand what I'm talking about. Um, when I talk to my girlfriend and she's got the clippers and I say something like that, I'm probably going to get a number three everywhere. Um, <laughs> that's just the reality of the situation. Um, so after I got my hair cut, I wanted to get an ice cream. Um, and, you know, at the ice cream store, they had these sizes, the like it, love it, and got to have it. Um, this is inherently awkward because I'm now having to use brand language that I don't really want to use to sort of discuss something that's conventional, small, medium, and large. Um, it's also, it's not functional. It feels awkward. Um, I'm also grammatically challenged. I now have to say, can I have a like it strawberry ice cream? It just feels weird, right? Um, for something that's so simple, small, medium, and large. Um, so... This is actually from a YouTube video where they say, you know, you don't rename your bathroom just to fit the culture of your company. So we don't go to KFC and we say, can I use the chicken bucket? We say, can I use the bathroom? And the employee at the, you know, at KFC doesn't say, do you mean the chicken bucket? They say, yeah, sure, the bathroom's around the corner. So it's important to think about the way we name things and not just the culture of our company. Um, design systems require lots of names. So... Um, for instance, our design system that I'm building, the Australian Government Design System, that's the name of our design system, the whole design system. Um, inside our design system, we also have things like variables. Uh, AU font, AU color foreground text. Um, the first one is our font family. The second one is our foreground text color. Um, and we also have the components, the class names that go with them. So AU grid, AU main nav, AU button, um, our grid system, our main navigation, our button. Um, we also have units, so when we work with designers and developers, a uh, designer may be saying this is 20 points, a developer may be saying this is 1M, 2RAM, 10 pixels, all kinds of different languages. Uh, we also have mix-ins and functions, um, font grid, media, focus, space for some of ours. Uh, font grid is quite a complicated one, it aligns our font families to our grids. Media is for media queries, focus, it applies a focus state. And space is for spacing, and that's pretty simple. Um, we also do releases. So when we release new components, we give them versions. Um, we may use semantic versioning. We may add a tag. Um, we may be deploying the next version of the component as well. Um, design systems also have events like this. Community events, uh, we would give them names. Design system meetup. Uh, we recently hosted our 2018 winter meetup for the Australian Government Design System. Um, and finally, the tools that go into them. So we've built tools called Pancake, Furnace, Alley Color, and Pizza. They're all really random and fun names, um, but I'll give you some reasons behind that later on. Um, so as you can see already, there's so many things that require names and design systems. That's not even going into the content um, that goes into them as well. 
So how should you name things? I'm just going to give you some quick tips about how we name things and what we sort of do when we go about naming things. Um, for instance, a lot of our variables in our class names and our components are prefixed. So uh, this sort of is really beneficial because there's a clear separation now between what is in our design system and what is external to our design system. If someone's using an external grid library, but they're also using our buttons, they should be able to tell the difference between uh, that grid library and our buttons, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's also really useful for analytics. So if you had specific uh, markup or class names, you can actually go and search that HTML and see, hey, how many websites are using our design system? Um, other people have been using data URLs as well, and um, you know, uh, data tags in the HTML to see uh, what versions of the components they're using. So really beneficial. Um, some of the things that we've had to name are things like a list of font sizes. Again, trying to be practical, let's just call it font sizes, AU font sizes. Um, colors used for interaction, let's call them our color action, AU color action. Um, in our case, we have foreground and background colors, but I'll get to that a bit later on. Um, a square box with rounded corners, it's card. Everyone's sort of familiar with these sorts of patterns. Um, but then we get into a bit more complicated things in our design system. So we may have a test of finding visual regressions. Um, simply, simply, it may just be a visual regression test. But what happens when uh, it's no longer a visual regression test, it's an open source product that we're sharing with other government agencies. Um, it's a test that gets ran multiple times from one URL that gets inputted on the command line. And it's got documentation and it's got logging. It's a bit more complicated than a visual regression test now. So you may want to name it something different. Um, another interesting thing that we had to name was a system to check for compatible versions of components. So this is to make sure that when we install our core version of our uh, core component, <laughs> our version of our core component, um, it will check that you know, the button version and the core version work together. Uh, this tool that we built actually does a whole lot more as well. It does things like compile CSS and minify JavaScript and put that in a folder for the user. So you kind of see the things that we build at the start may be something that's quite simple to call, you know, component version check, but then in the future, that's going to evolve and become something more. Um, and another example is an API that downloads components and their dependencies. Um, again, you could call it the download page for a user-facing thing because if they just press a button and they get a zip file. Uh, but for a developer, they're actually doing a whole lot more. They're building an API. It's taking certain calls. Um, it's bundling the files together, so it's not exactly lining up with just, we can't really call it the download page GitHub repository. It's kind of weird. Um, so the points I'm trying to make here is always go with functional and understandable. Um, always try and keep things simple and clear to what your users expect. Um, and I think there's also a, an element where you can start to name complicated things in fun and creative and unique ways. Um, you don't always have to be super functional and super understandable. There's opportunities to have fun as well. So what should you call your system? Um, for instance, there's lots of great examples out there already. Material design system, uh, reimagining surfaces, paper and ink. So material, for instance, you know, it's physical, you can touch it, the shadow. These things all come through in their design system. Uh, Polaris, the Shopify design system. Polaris is literally the North Star. So it was used by explorers and navigators to uh, seek you know, places and they use it for direction and guidance. So you can sort of see a relationship there. As a designer or a developer, you'd use the design system to get guidance and direction as well. Uh, GitHub's primary design system, you could maybe see this one as the first or the preliminary code. It sort of gives some idea as a designer or developer, this is just the base. I can change this, I can modify this, I can do my own things that I need to do with it. But this is what I start with. Um, and Microsoft's fluent design system, uh, listen, adapt, keep it natural, keep it easy to understand. So you can sort of see the way that we name things also convey uh, some of the values of our product, some of the expectations of our users, and some of the principles of our design system. Um, here's a really good example by Salesforce. Their design system is called the Lightning Design System. So some of their design principles include efficiency, <coughs> consistency, and beauty. Um, lightning can also be associated to these things. Lightning can be seen as efficient because it's extremely fast, it's a flash, um, it's consistent, it's in a fractal pattern, and I think lightning's pretty beautiful. We take lots of photos of lightning and we share it around. 
Um, naming is also important for things like marketing, open source, and community. What we name things affects how well it is marketable. Um, it also infle uh, influences our community. If we're going to print out stickers and merchandise and try and get people behind it, um, and that open source nature of getting those people involved as well. A really good example of this is the Microsoft Fluent Design System. They, you know, have T-shirts and drink bottles and all kinds of things um, related to their branding and what they call their design system. Um, another point that I'll make very quickly is that bad names cause confusion. Uh, our design system repository that hosts all of our components is called the UI Kit. So if I was a developer, I might go to Google and I might search Australian Government UI Kit. Um, the problem with that is there's a other famous front-end library called the UI Kit, and it's got 13,000 stars. Ours is 286. So, you know, it's a bit more popular. Um, but the problem there is we get issues like this raised. Like, what is the relation with the U theme UI Kit and your UI Kit? Um, and it's really interesting that the way that we named this thing that we didn't actually give much thought about in the initial aspect actually affects our users and how uh, they interact with our product. And names are really hard to change. So now that we've sort of got this thing and our users expect it, it's not something that we can just click our fingers and change. Um, so now diving into some of the more complicated things inside a design system and how we've sort of gone about trying to solve them. Um, one was uh, units. So I sort of briefly uh, talked about it before. Um, designers may be familiar with pickers and points. Uh, developers may be familiar with um, M's, pixels, and rems. So does anyone here know what an EM is, or what 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 the definition of an EM is, or what where the word EM came from. Sorry, someone's calling. Maybe they know. Probably don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, it's this size of a physical piece of data. Yeah. So that's that's a good good answer. But as a developer, they may know a different definition, but I think that's correct. So um, as a developer, I've got a developer background, I may say it's a unit in the field of typography equal to the currently specified point size. So if a parent element is 20 pixels and a chart element is 1M, that chart element is 20 pixels. If that chart element is 2M, it's now uh, 40 pixels because it multiplies by the element above it. Um, as a designer, you may say something like this. There's a capital letter M, and it creates an EM box based off the physical size of this little piece of metal that got pressed onto a printing press. Um, and so it's a unit for measuring the width of printed matter equal to the size of the type size being used based off the capital letter M equal to M. So you can sort of see the way that we name things is really complicated, and this affects lots of ways that we communicate. As a designer, they may understand one reasoning for what an M is, and as a developer, they may understand another. So in our case, um, we also had to sort of do a lot of other things in our design system. Not only did we have to uh, provide a pixel fallback, we wanted to use REM. So REM only supports a certain number of browsers, and we needed to support other browsers, so we did a pixel fallback. So now we're talking about two units. So when I talk to a designer as a developer, do I say this is two REM, or do I say this is 32 pixels? It becomes quite confusing. Uh, you also need to align the typography to a grid. So in our cases, we needed to also modify the line height so it snaps to a grid. Um, and our users, and internally, um, they use design software and code. So these things don't translate well. If I'm sitting there talking to Trevor, a designer who I used to work with, and I said, hey, this is about 8 rem, that gap, and he'd be like, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't get that. Um, so th these, these phrases are no longer correct. So what can you do in this situation? Um, well, we created our own unit. Uh, at the start, we were going to call it the G unit. So, <laughs> gangster unit, global unit, I don't know. It was just a fun phrase that we were floating internally for our unity system. Um, we thought it'd be pretty cool to be like, yeah, man, that's that's three G units to the left. So, you know, it's one, one G unit spacing on that button. Um, but we ended up just calling it a unit. Like, it made more sense. So, now in our design system, if you implement... Um, Spacing, it looks something like this, a space padding one unit, and that would actually render 16 pixels or one RAM. Um, for a designer, they know that one unit uh, equivalates to four grid spaces. So in their design software, they can sort of go, okay, 0.25 of a unit is one grid section, so I can sort of work from there. So you actually can sort of 
work with a design that's 10 times the size of the website and still be like, that's three units. And you're like, okay, cool. I get what you're talking about. Um, so creating a common language, uh, common language creates a shared understanding. Designers and developers can now uh, easily talk to each other and there's no longer a conflict. There's no confusion. They can say the same things and talk to each other. Um, so releases, this is a really interesting one. Um, the, the common thing that I think most developers here would be used to is semantic versioning. So that looks something like this, version 1.0.0. .0 .0. Um, this translates to major minor patch. So if I was going to do a patch to a component that was version one, I'd increase the last number by one, so it'd be 1.0.1. .1. If I was to increase the minor version, it would be 1.1.0. So to me, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but the question I'd ask you is, does your user care? In some cases, they would care. There would be a developer and they'd be like, I need to know that this button is version two or if this button is version four. In other cases, um, they don't care. And the names that we give things can actually um, influence the user experience. So in the case of the Airbnb design system, they do uh, quarterly milestones. And when they release a new um, major version of their design system on each quarter, they actually um, give it an album art and give it a name. So in their case, their uh, version two of their uh, design system is called Betelgeuse. It's um, some star. I don't really get why they called it that. And maybe it's internal culture. But the idea is that it um, helps their teams digest and it builds that, this relationship and this culture internally. They're going to get t-shirts and printouts and it's going to create this interesting um, environment. This isn't new though, we see this all the time with operating systems, Android release new versions, they call them after foods. Um, Mac has been calling their new versions um, after animals and locations as well. Um, more recently, um, going back to the point that names influence user experience, um, Mac is releasing a new version called Mojave. And by default, you get this beautiful picture of the Mojave Desert, um, but their new feature is night mode, so everything goes black. Um, so inherently, the background picture also goes black. So the features and the ways that we name thing also flow into the products that we create and they affect the user experience. Um, open source. So um, I think that open source is more than what you call your package or repository. So the way that you name thing can actually influence your open source community and the culture that you create. Um, it, it most importantly, we have to name things in a memorable and discoverable way. We don't want to have a name that is already used. Um, so, for instance, here's an open source project that I was working on. It's called SAS Alley Color. So this is quite functional and understandable. Um, as a developer, it's using the SAS programming language and it finds the nearest accessible color. So if I was Google searching SAS accessible color, I would hope that this repository would show up. Um, in another instance, I've created an open source repository <laughs> called The Furnace. Um, so as a, as a first impression, you may have no idea of what this does, but it says that it melts down the gold design system components into a zip file. So we've sort of taken something abstract, um, like a furnace and sort of thought, how can we turn uh, what is known as like a design, uh, sorry, a download page with, with check boxes and give it an interesting fun name to sort of create this, this <coughs> culture of not being too serious. So, um, for instance, a furnace in real life takes these little pieces of metal, they melt it at a super hot temperature and they output like a chunk of metal. Um, the same thing can sort of be said with our uh, download page. You, you tick some boxes, which are like buttons, header, footer. You say, I want CSS, I want JavaScript minified and you press download and you get a zip file. So there's some similar patterns going on there. Uh, you also get to do cool things like this, uh, like do an illustration of what it could look like. Um, <laughs> it's pretty fun. Um, uh, colors, so I think this is a pretty classic one when people think of naming things and I think design systems as well. Um, one of the first things I always think about is my girlfriend's nail polishes, they're pretty funny. Um, things like alpaca my bags, blue, um, tell me more, tell me more, I don't know. It's like just great puns and things like this. So you can have a lot of fun with colors. Um, at the same time, this isn't new. This is something that we've seen before with CSS. Things like Alice Blue, Burley Wood, um, Dark Golden Rotter colors that you can actually use in CSS. Um, for our design system, we've gone with more functional. Um, our colors need to meet accessibility. So it's really important that we have foreground colors that pass on background colors. So our colors are quite practically AU color foreground action, AU color foreground focus, AU color background, AU color background shade, etc. 
Um, so you know that if you put a foreground color on a background color, you're going to meet contrast and you're going to be accessible. You're going to meet accessibility. Um, this isn't new. Um, lots of other design systems do similar patterns with functionality. Uh, IBM here is using brand colors. So obviously these would be what you'd expect as a developer or designer to put in headers and footers. Um, you'd expect these colors to be used in logos. Um, they also have using, excuse me, um, user interface colors and text colors. Um, the same can be said with material design with their primary and secondary and background surface and error. Um, but at the same time, colors can also be, uh, thanks, um, colors can also be a bit more significant. The color Rebecca Purple is actually a memorial for a child's passing. Um, her name was Rebecca. She is the daughter of Eric Meyer, um, who is a big person in the web industry. I'm sure lots of you know about him. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, we don't need to be too serious and we can actually sort of influence our culture by naming things. Um, so in summary, um, I think that the way that you name things can create a positive culture and naming is the hard work to make it simple. So quite often um, we should do this, make ubiquitous things simple and standard. Don't call your small like it and your medium love it. Just call it small and call it medium. I think that's pretty understandable. Um, and a common language brings people together. So when you see um, conflict or you see confusion, try and think, is this a language problem? Is this a communication problem? Can it be solved by using a common language or the way that we name things? Um, and the way that we name things can also create better user experiences. If that's a developer um, developing something, I'm now developing in the furnace and my logs are coming out saying, uh, you know, furnace is firing up and things like this. I'm like, this is cool. I'm, you know, playing around in a furnace now, but really just coding in a command line. Um, I don't know. It's fun. Have fun with it. Um, the way that you name things can make a better user experience for you users. Um, and they can also shape the culture and your values of your organization. So most importantly, have fun um, when you name things. I don't think you should take it too seriously. Um, so I'm going to leave you with two questions. Feel free to come up to me with your answers. Um, and then I'll let you ask questions. So what is your favorite name in the design system space? Mine is Cascading Style Sheets. I think it's a really interesting way to name style sheets and the way that it works as well. Um, and when did you first name something? The thing that I could remember was probably naming my Pokemon trainer when I was like eight years old. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting question. So if you want to come up to me and ask, uh, give me your answer, I'd love to hear from you. But yeah, feel free to ask me any questions.